Okay, hi, welcome everyone. Um, for once you are here and also for you who are watching this uh, recording, uh, we are very happy to have our sixth uh, webinar uh, in the IMIM community. So today we're gonna talk about value generation uh, using data science. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a very interesting, trendy topic at the moment. So it's related to, I would say, to, um, to data, big data and statistics, and, uh, and of course, uh, informatics and how this shapes for, for business decisions. So um, we are gonna have a small presentation about the IMIM, in case that you are new to our IMIM community. Uh, then we're gonna uh, present our keynote speaker uh, today, Professor Preciado from Tecnología de Monterrey, and then um, we're going to have some Q&A session uh, and well, some information about our next webinars and where you can watch the, the recordings of this webinar and our previous uh, other five webinars as well. So um, basically, uh, the, the outcome uh, for today um, uh, after you have watched this, uh, this webinar or you have attended this webinar is uh, to know more about how you can use statistical modeling uh, and different computer science approaches for this decision making and how you can uh, create solutions uh, using data science and the value that you, that you can create for this. So uh, things like pricing optimization, uh, the, the appliances into industry 4.0, uh, how to do traffic demand modeling are some of the topics, okay, that, that we're going to cover today. But of course, our keynote speaker will explain more about this later on. Um, so uh, my name is Isaac uh, Limus. I'm uh, a professor at Universidad Politécnica de Madrid in Spain. Uh, we are the uh, coordinator institution in this uh, IMIM program with a consortium, which means that we are uh, different universities affiliated to, to to deliver this, uh, this program. So welcome from, from our side. And uh, what's the IMIM? So the, the IMIM is a multi site program, which means that you get to study in different places. Uh, I will show you the, the mobility uh, later. Uh, and the idea is that you get more training into business and managerial skills, okay? So it's very similar to uh, an MBA program, but it has the advantage or the, the extinction that uh, you also use many engineering uh, background theories behind so that we are combining uh, and that's our, uh, our proposition. Uh, we have been recognized by the European Union uh, as one of the Rasmus Mundus labels, which means that uh, this is one of the high quality programs uh, that have been sponsored by the European Commission. And this is the program structure. So um, you will start learning about management in uh, UPM. Uh, in Madrid, so things related to strategy, resources to data, accounting, marketing, general introduction to management topics will be here uh, in the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. During the second semester, you will go to our partner in the, in the UK, uh, headed at University, and there you will learn more about projects and, 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 and operations in the company. And then you can choose for the third semester uh, for different options. So one option is that you go uh, to the Dubai campus of Heriwat University to have a specialization in supply chain management. Uh, another option, if you prefer to go uh, for a specialization in finance, um, it's uh, Politengo di Torino in Italy. The third option would be uh, how to do business with China. And our partner is Northwestern Polytechnical University in Xi'an. Uh, or the other option uh, is to have a specialization in data science and innovation. And you can choose uh, any of the three campuses from the Tecnológico de Monterrey, uh, either in Mexico City or Guadalajara or Monterrey. So today, actually, um, our keynote speaker is from, from this university, the, the last university, and uh, he's from, uh, from campus uh, Monterrey. And then the last semester, that is the semester where uh, every student uh, performs their master thesis, uh, they can actually be located everywhere in the world. So we have no limitation here. The only thing is that you have, you need to have a tutor from any of our partner universities, but you can do an internship uh, in a company or you can do a university-based research as well. And this can happen at, uh, during the fourth semester at any part in the world. So it's, it's very flexible in that sense. 
Uh, our students come from everywhere, so you can see here, okay, we have representation from all the continents, uh, mainly from Asia, um, from Europe, okay, so, um, but now with our new partners, we also expect more representation from, from, uh, from the Americas in, in general. And this is our, these are some of the companies that where our graduates are working right now, okay, so if you can see they are in, in the top, in the top uh, manufacturing and service industries and also with many top uh, employers, okay? So if you want to, to find out more about the IMI program and, or you know somebody who could be interested in this, uh, you can also write direct uh, them to us and um, we have more details, okay, uh, about that uh, in, uh, in the end, in the, in the last slide of, of this presentation. Good, so uh, having said that, now um, I would like to welcome again uh, to Professor Jose Luis Preciado. Um, he uh, is currently the director of the Master in Engineering Management at uh, Tech de Monterrey uh, in, in, in the campus uh, in Monterrey. And, um, and well, he's gonna be our keynote speaker today. So um, I, I will give now the, the floor to him so that he can start with with his presentation, please. Okay, good. So I'll start sharing my screen and we'll start talking about uh, value generation using data science. So let me start sharing that. Okay, and switching to presentation mode now. All right, so today's talk is gonna be about, uh, first of all, a little bit of background, okay, on how uh, modern data science came to be. Uh, which is something I'm pretty interested in because now I'm doing data science, but uh, I actually had to study other things because there were no data science degrees uh, back when I was studying, which wasn't that long time uh, ago. It was probably 10 years ago or something like that. There were no data science programs. Even I would say five years ago, there weren't uh, very many. So uh, you had to be uh, strong in one of the fields that ended up uh, merging or like, interacting to create modern data science. So I'm going to get, give you a little bit of background. It's always it's, it's something uh, I always want to uh, cover in my data science talks uh, because I think it's uh, interesting and it's also useful because it teaches you what was the train of thought, the different trains of thought that had to collide uh, in order to get to modern data science. Okay, and I precisely talk about that convergence uh, in a couple of slides after uh, talking about the background. Uh, after that, uh, being this, uh, being uh, our master's in engineering management programs, uh, more, more of an applied flavor, uh, I have devoted uh, about half of the talk for uh, case studies, okay, for some case studies from my own uh, either professional or research experience, okay, and I explain how to create or how uh, what we have uh, created data science solutions that have been able to to add significant values in the context we were applying them. Okay, so well, uh, let's get started with a bit of background. So first of all, statistical modeling has been around uh, since forever, since uh, maybe a couple of uh, centuries, even if you go back to, to the linear regression model. And it, it was already widespread before uh, the spawn of modern data science, of course. And some of the most uh, often used tools uh, were genera generalized linear models, uh, either for uh, regression tasks or for classification tasks. And with generalized linear models, I include, of course, the classical uh, ordinary least squares, like linear regression uh, type of thing. It, it is uh, a subset of generalized linear models, but also uh, logistic regression, for instance, Poisson regression, and we have actually used Poisson regression in a couple of uh, mo very modern solutions, and it ended up being uh, the best choice to go. So GLMs are definitely still there. They're alive and kicking, okay? But they have been around for uh, quite a long time, okay? Then another classical problem in statistical modeling is that of uh, density estimation. So why would you want uh, to estimate a density in the first place? Well, it usually comes 
uh, from the context where you don't have a lot of data. So where this histogram that you're creating uh, out of uh, some observations is not fully reliable in the sense that it doesn't include everything that could have happened, okay, in your population because you're dealing, uh, because you got it from a sample pretty much, right? So then we have all these density estimation theory uh, that has been around forever. For instance, MLE, maximum likelihood estimation is one way of doing it. Uh, Bayesian, uh, a Bayesian approaches, of course, also exist for this. You have a prior, then you multiply uh, times the likelihood and you get something proportional to the posterior, right? And just renormalize it and you can get uh, your posterior density. And uh, the other classical problem in statistical modeling is hypothesis testing, right? So I have two samples from different populations and I want to show that one particular metric or characteristic is different in one or the other. So if you're thinking about uh, highly applied uh, contexts in uh, management of, of a management flavor, uh, so this can be maybe sales in two sets of stores that are comparable uh, in every other sense. So they are similar in many of their characteristics, maybe look maybe the kind of city they're located in, maybe the size of the store, maybe the kind of market they serve, and they have maybe similar assortments. Well, uh, that's possibly a candidate for a good hypothesis, a good all, uh, all hypothesis tests, right? Okay, so that has been around forever. Now, what is the context? So what was the context where all these techniques were created? So, all these techniques, all these theory uh, came before uh, massive data sets were available, okay? So the context where these uh, models were supposed to, to take, uh, to, 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 to be at, its, at their full potential, let's say, uh, was a context of scarce data. Okay, so you didn't have a lot of data. In many cases, you had to specially collect it for whatever study you were conducting. Okay, so it's like, hey, I want to show that a pattern exists or a correlation exists. Well, I'm going to collect data for this specific population and just for my very particular study, okay, because data was expensive to collect. Okay, so if data was expensive to collect, then you want to just do it uh, as much as needed, right? So there was no this, there, there was no organic source of data. There was not an there was not a source of data that just kept on growing organically because of an infrastructure, okay? Well, uh, moreover, one other characteristic uh, these models have is that many times they will assume that the data is generated from a specific probability model, okay? So in the case of OLS, if you wanna do, you don't need to assume normality, but if you wanna, have nicer inference uh, results. Uh, it's so sometimes you do assume normality in the residuals and do some uh, model checks against that, for instance. Then speaking about that, there is a strong emphasis, emphasis in, meeting, in meeting model assumptions. So classically, uh, when you went uh, to school and you learned linear regression or maybe design of experiments or something along that line, uh, that where you had to use a linear model, uh, you have there, there, there is a strong focus on those courses to uh, spend a lot of time on residual analysis, right? So essentially, you assumed that these data had specifically the structure described by your GLM. And of course, your GLM or generalized linear model uh, is has, has some parameters you can estimate, right? So for in the example of linear regression, you, you estimate the coefficients. So you estimate some parameters in your GLM. And then after you estimate them, okay, you said, well, this is my model, but, uh, but I also assumed a lot of things about the residuals. So maybe not a lot of things, but very specific things. It's like, maybe you assumed a normal distribution for the residuals and you need to go and check against that. If you didn't assume a normal distribution, at least something you need for OLS is not having heteroscedasticity, which is different variants. Okay, so maybe you do a heteroscedasticity test, right, or, or do some plots to check 
that heteroscasticity in the residuals is not present. And after doing all these residual analyses and, good, and goodness of fit diagnostics, you say, well, data, I, I cannot show that data doesn't behave like the model I assume, which is, which, which is kind of a way to, to, to skew things a little bit in, in the, a, a little bit to the, to the route where your model works, okay? So well, that is, uh, by the way, I adapted this figure from uh, this great paper, which makes these contrasts between this line of thinking and another kind of thinking I'm gonna show you in a couple of minutes, okay? It's called statistical modeling of uh, the two cultures. Okay, well, now <clears throat> there, are, after, after that, uh, more modern uh, models uh, became available. They are mostly non-parametric in nature. So meaning the objective is not to summarize the information we get from data in a set of parameters anymore, okay? Which was the case in the, in the GLMs, for instance. So here we have highly flexible models that can grow more and more complex the more, uh, the more data you have, okay? So they have very, very high degree of flexibility, a lot of degrees of freedom. Okay, if you want to think about it in that way. So if you think of a GLM, every parameter is a degree of freedom, right? In, this, in these non-parametric models, they intrinsically have a very large number of degrees of freedom to uh, actually fit data, okay? Well, so examples of, of these uh, developments are, of course, decision trees and neural networks. And nowadays, uh, you have decision tree ensembles uh, are probably the most popular way to predict uh, structured data. And uh, neural nets, stack neural nets, which is deep learning, uh, is, uh, is the most popular way to deal with non-structured data, such as voice, texts, images, and whatever. Okay, so essentially using uh, either decision trees or neural nets in complex ensembles, or in complex ensembles in the case of trees, or in a stacked way in the case of neural networks, is what gives you, uh, what leads you to the state of the art of, of this kind of modeling. Also uh, regression, so these are useful for regression and classification uh, tasks, but uh, you then also have uh, unsupervised learning such as, uh, such as the one that takes place with clustering. So in clustering, you essentially wanna group uh, data points that have similar X variables or uh, independent variables, okay? You want to try to create groups that are distinct from each other. And maybe the most popular al algorithm to do this is k-means. Maybe you've heard about it. And uh, finally, so a lot of the tools uh, based on, a lot of the tools that develop upon uh, these uh, more modern models uh, can, can use resampling. So for instance, the very famous uh, random forest algorithm uses uh, heavy uses heavily uh, the resampling techniques, and an example of that a resampling plan is bootstrapping. Okay, so we use bootstrapping to actually get some inference in these uh, in these more complex models because in the classical models you automatically got the inference right. So with even with some equations in some cases, so if you run a linear regression and uh, you're okay with assuming normality and you see your residuals and, and they behave, uh, and you don't reject the hypothesis test for normality. Well, in that case, you automatically know what the confidence intervals of your prediction are, okay? Just with an equation. Here, in this kind of models is not nearly as straightforward. You need to resample the data, rerun your model to get uh, some confidence intervals. So it's much more, much more computationally intensive. Okay, and precisely the model context uh, for this kind of models is, is different, okay? So these models came to be when uh, we had, when we already had a data rich context, okay? So we have abundant data now. And if you notice the, the icon here, this is a database meant to rep represent a database while this was meant to represent a single file, okay? Right, so we have abundant data. This is a data rich context. And 
for starters, and something I like a lot is that we don't assume that our model is right. Okay, so we assume that there is some data generation process. Okay, there is some data generation process and uh, we are trying to approximate it with these highly uh, flexible non-parametric models. Okay, and the validation here, since we were not assuming the data behaved the way we said it was going to behave, the validation here is of a completely different nature. So here we want to validate by checking whether the predictive error of the models we are uh, coming up with is acceptable. And with acceptable, uh, I mean within the bounds defined by the problem context. And then next, uh, does the interpretation meet basic axioms of the application context? Of course, these models uh, often by especially by people who are, who are using them for the, for the first uh, times or first couple of times, uh, they uh, think of these models as uh, black boxes or almost, uh, or if they're very optimistic as gray boxes. But in reality, uh, there's a lot of mining, you, a lot of pattern mining you can do in these models. And you can extract a very, very clear uh, interpretation of what the model is doing, interpretations of what the model is doing. It requires a lot more computational work though, but you can get actually clear interpretations of what's going on on the subset of the, of the response surface that you estimated that you care the most about, okay? So well, uh, so here, uh, these machine learning models uh, consider the repeated use of estimators. So for instance, if you're doing random forests or gradient boosted trees, uh, you are actually re repeatedly feeding, feeding trees to your data. Uh, they assume that data is generated from an unknown process and they use an algorithm to estimate the process, okay? You can, as I said, you can get inference uh, from these algorithms, but you require heavily resample, to heavily resample the data, okay? So there's a strong emphasis in measuring predictive error and in the interpretability of the model, but this doesn't mean you cannot get formal inference results. Okay, well, at least computational results. Okay, guys. So then uh, how are statistics relevant to the case studies I'm going to present? Well, because uh, I will uh, talk about how uh, you can use GLMs for choice models for tollways. So for instance, if you're trying to build a new road that will be the competitor of a currently existing road and you're planning to charge for that road, or if you want to have a toll lane in, a, in an existing, in an existing uh, freeway, you can estimate, or an existing highway, you can estimate a utility function based on some input data I will discuss about to uh, create a choice model for those who will select the tollway and who will select the free option, okay? And with that, you can actually uh, put some uh, value or assign some economic value to it actually uh, building the tollway, okay? All right, uh, we're also going to use uh, time series models and these are ARIMA models or Box Jenkins models to uh, capture seasonality in, some, in, in one of the case studies I'm gonna be talking about. And for price optimization, we're going to uh, estimate price elasticity of demand, uh, again, using either GLMs or the machine learning models that I talked about. And uh, finally, we uh, will use something called uh, Pareto Frontier to assess the performance uh, and performance versus quality uh, prediction, sorry, performance versus quality trade-off of the predictions we're getting, okay? So all this stuff we just talked about, we're gonna land it down in uh, some of the case studies we're gonna cover in this latter part of this presentation. Okay, that was the learning part. Okay, so that was the background about the learning part. And I know that there's really strong emphasis on this right now. It's like if you go online or in the research communities and whatever, there's a lot of focus on this. But let's not forget about the second half of your data science solution. So the first part of your data science solution is about understanding patterns, extracting patterns from data, understanding how demand behaves. <clears throat> how a particular manufacturing process behaves in the, in the context of an industry 4.0 uh, solution, okay? 
However, once you know the patterns, sometimes it's easy to make decisions uh, based just on those patterns, but sometimes it's hard. And sometimes there are constraints to the, uh, to the decision alternatives you have. And to uh, actually put that in math and be able to put it inside of a solution requires optimization, okay? So optimization is what allows us to make uh, concrete choices, okay, based on the patterns that we have already learned from the learning algorithms, okay? So in optimization, the classical techniques are possibly linear programming, uh, nonlinear programming, and integer programming. Of course, you have mixed integer programming, which uh, mixes integers with uh, non-integer variables. Okay, well, so some classical example of optimization applications are transportation problems, where you have uh, some sources of demand and some sources of uh, supply. Okay, and then you want to match them to minimize uh, some sort of uh, transportation cost, maybe. Then you have the generalized resource allocation problem, which uh, comes up in portfolio management. So let's say you have a limited budget or you have limited space or you have limited uh, area, and then you want to distribute that budget across different uh, potential projects, okay, or different uh, potential investment alternatives. And it turns out that since it's a discrete choice problem, it's not as simple as just computing the the, the benefit to cost uh, ratio, right? So you actually have some uh, special solution structure because it's an integer program, okay? And it's called the generalized resource allocation problem. And lastly, in a classic manufacturing context, uh, you have the aggregate planning problem where you're trying to match your uh, workforce and maybe other resources such as machine time uh, to uh, your particular demand forecast. Okay, so good. So here are uh, some examples that we will use in our case studies. So for traffic engineering and like for tollway modeling, uh, you solve an optimization problem called uh, user, re user equilibrium. And with that, you can create uh, hopefully a reliable representation of where traffic is going to, of how traffic is going to distribute, okay. Then for the price optimization case study I will present, uh, we have price optimization considering product substitution. So essentially, if you have a substitutable group of products, how uh, to price the products inside of those groups in such a way that they cannibalize each other the least possible and that you optimize for either revenue traffic or margin, depending on what you're interested in. And uh, finally, uh, in the other case study, we will use the graph or generalized resource allocation problem to uh, select uh, projects or like production lines in a facility that are the better candidates or the best candidates to uh, have a digital twin. Okay. Okay, cool. So optimization. Optimization has also been touched by uh, this uh, data science revolution. So classically, you have also a data collection uh, process or data collection stage because data collection was uh, exp relatively expensive in terms of uh, the resources it consumed. Then uh, that led you to some estimation of parameters because your uh, optimization problems require some uh, parameters to be known. So if you think of a linear program, you need to know the coefficients, let's say the cost coefficients, what is the fixed cost, what is the variable cost of things. And you would need to know what are the rate of resource consumption, okay, of, re of consumption of resources. So these parameters can be either estimated or are known uh, by the business context and so on and so forth. But these were questions you uh, used to ask once, okay, once every time you run this. And finally, you came up with a solution and you uh, generated some scenarios, right? So, hey, what would happen if the cost went up by 10% or if the resource consumption became uh, more efficient and we were able to lower it down a little, would that change the optimal solution, right? So this is the classic flow for your optimization uh, problem solution. However, now that we have 
uh, real-time data and that we have massive data stores, well, this is happening more in a cyclical way, okay? So you actually solve the optimization problem with the data that is available at one point in time, but then you refresh the solution, uh, then you refresh the solution uh, gradually, okay? Not gradually, sorry, periodically. And this periodicity can be uh, actually quite short. So it can be a daily thing. So for some price optimization uh, models, uh, they are refreshing every day. Uh, and uh, especially like for online prices. So here you come up with an optimal solution. You post that solution uh, to your website, for instance, and then that leads you into a new data feed for how demand reacted. And then with that uh, data feed of uh, the new demand patterns that you generated by changing the price, maybe some of the parameters change. So maybe that leads you to a re-estimation of your uh, price elasticity of demand function. And then that goes back into your optimization problem. Okay, so this is solving in a very uh, periodic way. And sometimes the periodicity, as I said, can be short. Okay, so that was, this is a transformation that optimization has uh, gone through uh, because of the massive uh, availability of data. Okay, finally, and I have to talk about this, even though uh, none of the case studies are about this, but, but it's an important thing to mention. Uh, in computer science, uh, just like people in statistics and, econo and econometrics, uh, we're dealing with uh, quantities, like very specific uh, structured problems. Uh, the people in computer science, so computer science communities, were dealing with uh, unstru unstructured problems, problems of an unstructured nature, such as uh, text, uh, images, and voice. So in text, we have what's called natural language processing. In images, we have image recognition. And in voice, we have speech recognition. So uh, people in the computer science community uh, were uh, dealing more with this kind of problems. And nowadays, uh, deep learning is uh, the state of the art, we would say. And the usual metric for this kind of problem, since there's no structure you need to comply with uh, in, in, this, uh, in this kind of a problem. So if you think of an econometric problem, you want your demand function at least to be monotonic, at least to be monotonic, if not monotonic and convex, right? Not monotonic and concave, depending. So in econometric problems, in problems of that nature of the, pro the nature of problems that the statistics communities and the optimization people were dealing with, those problems were very structured nature. Here, the solution doesn't need to have a particular structure. So deep learning has provided a great uh, degree of flexibility and also of pre-processing flexibility, okay, of, uh, of, the, of this raw data in order to turn it into a useful solution, okay? So in other words, in econometrics, when you create a new variable, it usually has to mean something. It needs to have that a very concrete uh, context uh, specific meaning, okay? Here, you can create all sorts of features. And if you have an algorithm that does it automatically for you, like deep learning, well, the better. Cool. Finally, let's talk about the, con let's talk about the convergence then of these, uh, trains of thought or these are research uh, bodies of knowledge and how they came to be uh, together, just one thing and uh, allow us to, to build a modern data science solutions. Okay, so one key uh, aspect that happened in this uh, revolution were the breakthroughs in computing power. Okay, so now you could estimate these highly complex non-parametric estimators and moreover, you could do it with high, with large volumes of data, and moreover, you could do it repeatedly in order to get inference out of them. Okay. Uh, also, the algorithms or the estimators have uh, become more and more efficient. So, personally, I have worked on uh, non-parametric uh, convex or concave, if you want to see it that way, uh, regression algorithms, and these algorithms uh, were advancing more and more uh, to essentially accommodate more data and to run uh, quicker. So of course, uh, advances in data storage capabilities have also uh, allowed us to do this because now you can have 
uh, data set, sorry, uh, databases that are uh, cloud stored and that you can uh, pull from you know, in a reliable way. And finally, and something I really want to highlight is the democratiza democratization of solutions through open source uh, libraries. So a few years ago, if you wanted to code something like a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, you had to do it yourself. And you had to know uh, some very specific, uh, some very specific uh, context, sorry, uh, concepts about what you were doing and you had to be really sure and really knowledgeable about every step you were conducting. But now you have these libraries coded by experts and you can use, uh, you, you can be one degree closer to an user and one degree less of a developer, which helps you, uh, which have helped the spread of, uh, of these uh, solutions, okay? Okay, so let me see how I'm doing on time. Uh, how am I doing, Isaac? Do I have like five minutes or 10 minutes? Yes, uh, I mean, do you have five, 10 minutes? Uh... Okay, cool. It will take me about 10. All right, so well. Then finally, we have an increased rate of data collection, uh, pattern learning, and solution updating to better suit their changing environments. environments. Okay. So now we have this context of abundant data, and then we have, and that is, uh, and these abundant data is, are, are linked to this highly flexible non-parametric models for pattern learning. And then these patterns are fed into optimization models for decision-making. And once those decisions are made, the responses uh, or the changes that the data generation process suffered are again stored in this uh, abundant or big data sets, okay? So now it's, it has come full cycle and there is communication across these three uh, links, okay? Moreover, if you build a solution uh, that, so all of this is on the background, all of this is the back end. If you build the front end to that, through, let's say you create an app with a, user, with a user interface, okay? That can allow some of the preferences, let's say you don't care about sales anymore and you, can, you care more about margin for a particular product category or the cost of some uh, input changes, okay? Or there's a new business rule of some sort, then these user interfaces can allow uh, users to actually modify what is allowable, especially in the optimization problem, in the optimization program, okay, in such a way that uh, solutions that are constrained in a different way are now available, okay. So let's not forget about the front end because that's an other, that's another uh, great feature we have available now. So with this front end, you can alter what's happening here and have some input in your into your final solution. Moreover, uh, you can have a user interface to actually approve or disapprove what the engine is coming up with, okay? So here at the very end, you also have the users, the user validating the decision this system or this engine made and updating policies and priorities, okay? So this is how your modern data science solution looks like. And it's highly complex. They take a bit to, to actually come, uh, come to be, but this is how they look and it's pretty cool. Okay, let's go over some uh, case studies quickly. So the first of them, it's really close to my heart. Um, this was uh, the kind of stuff I was doing at Home Depot's Innovation Lab uh, a couple of years ago. So price optimization in retail, uh, we have, <clears throat> several sources of data. We have point of sales data. So essentially uh, what's in the stores or what is in the, in the website um, to all these records of sales and the conditions in which these sales uh, came to be. So what was the price, if there was a discount, uh, what day was it on what month, okay? Wh on which store did it happen? Uh, and in the case of online data, what did they click before <laughs> or something uh, or things along that line? And you also have data from the product catalog. 
and from the product catalog essentially <clears throat> to see which products were available in the assortment of a specific store, for instance, or which products are substitutable with other products. Then you have uh, macroeconomic data. So you have macroeconomic data uh, in the sense that, well, can we expect demographics in one region to be the same as in a different region? Does it make sense to uh, have different demand estimations? Okay, <clears throat> and then we have, of course, user-defined policies and business rules, okay? All of that is put together in a cloud computing and sorry, in a cloud store, cloud-based storage, and our solution will use uh, cloud computing afterwards. Okay, so we use uh, machine learning or statistical learning uh, to estimate the demand and price elasticity functions, and also to conduct a cluster analysis for outlier detection. And once we come up with the solution we think makes sense in terms of the prices, then we conduct, we usually conduct pilots and we do A-B testing. And this has to do with hypothesis testing to uh, have to build a control group, <clears throat> a test group, and see if the treatment or the price changes we suggested uh, made uh, sense, okay? Then lastly, uh, sometimes we, we're not uh, able to come up with a control group. So what we do is using time series analysis to extract the pattern before we conduct the test and use that as a counterfactual. So pretty much if we had done nothing, this model describes what would have happened. And here is what actually happened, okay? Okay, cool. So how does optimization uh, come into place in, the, in price optimization in retail? Well, as I have mentioned a couple of times already, uh, we have some substitutable product groups and you wanna optimize uh, the revenue that you get from the group as a whole, okay? And we use uh, mixed integer programming. And the cool thing again is that all of this takes place in a, in, in, in a single Python solution. So you have some Python code doing the learning and using the, the GLMs or the non-parametric models and in a different function, uh, you have the optimization happening uh, in also, also in Python, okay? So you don't need to have any more these uh, separate solvers for optimization problems and this separate software for estimating uh, statistical models. You can do everything in one solution, okay? And in the same language, which is really convenient. Okay. So we use uh, this data science convergent co convergence concept here in the sense that uh, we were able to build apps to recommend uh, prices and assortment changes. And we were able to build online apps that track the A-B testing, the A-B tests we were conducting. And then the user can say, well, this A-B test is going terribly in this market. So let's shut it off and go back to the previous price. And in the case of uh, price recommendations, you can uh, actually approve or disapprove recommendations for, from the engine. Okay, now the most recent one I have worked on uh, is uh, predictive defect detection in an industry 4.0 context. So this might sound like ex ex as extremely different from the previous case study, but it's actually not. So only the data sources are different. I would say, and also the fact that there, instead of having uh, economic theory as your source of constraints and your source of structure for the solution in the other, in the other problem, I, in the case study number one, here we have uh, physics and metallurgical knowledge as the as the, as a constraint uh, source. Okay, so essentially, whatever solution you come up with. It needs to make sense to the experts, <laughs> okay? And it has to come uh, from actionable sources, okay? So actionable parts of the process. And it needs not to come from variables that are results of other variables. And that's why you need to incorporate expert knowledge uh, in, the, in this case. So, well, um, in this case, the data is based on two sources. Uh, the first source are sensors. Okay, so we have a highly sensorized uh, manufacturing process. In this case, it was uh, steel galvanizing. And 
you also have data from visual inspections. So essentially data is coming into the databases as well as it's being punched by some uh, operators. Okay, so two sources of data, mostly from sensors, I would say 99% of data from sensors or 95% of data from sensors and the remaining data from visual inspections. And so what, would we, so what did we do here? Uh, we had to actually use machine learning models for regression and classification to try to find defects in products. And some of these defects are uh, of a discrete nature. They either happen or don't happen. And some other of these defects uh, happen against uh, a threshold or a, or a what do they call this? specification limit. So you have to predict this continuous quantity. And if this continuous quantity goes above the upper specification limit or goes below the lower specification limit, then uh, it's a defect. Okay. So sometimes, so for some of these properties of the materials, we uh, use regression models of, and for some other uh, properties or defects, we use uh, classification models. Okay. Now, if you have a very mature process uh, like uh, steel galvanizing, well, it happens that you have a really pronounced imbalance in the data set. So maybe you can have uh, defect rates that are below 1%. So below 1% of your data is defective and the other 99% is not defective. So we actually had to tailor heavily the algorithms to be able to extract signal from here, from this kind of pattern. And in the same sense, we also had to create some ad hoc dimensionality reduction algorithms that work in this highly imbalanced context and with the kind of goals the company had. So in this case, this company was most interested in minimizing the low, uh, sorry, the false negative rate. So they, they wanted to catch all the defects. And then as a secondary objective, they wanted to produce the smallest number of false positives they could, okay? So in this, let's say, goal programming context, so multi-objective optimization kind of context, we had to also link the dimensionality reduction strategy to that, which is kind of cool. Okay, so after we came up, uh, so we, we came up with a surface of uh, different solutions, which uh, build a Pareto frontier, if you want to call it that way, because that's the way I call it at least. And between... And these frontiers described the, the, the trade-off between false positive rates and false negative rates that we got out of the different model configurations, uh, out of the model configurations. And from these model configurations, of course, we want to select one of them. So it is partly expert knowledge and partly uh, we can use it, uh, partly we can do it using uh, portfolio management uh, optimization, like, like the one we do with uh, generalized resource allocation problems. So essentially, if for a particular uh, production line, we're able to achieve a reasonable solution and for another one, we're not able to achieve not such a reasonable solution, even if the second one is most variable, is most valuable, sorry, in terms of the potential income, you have to weight how good your prediction is versus how much uh, or how valuable is the correct effects on that production line. Put this into an optimization problem and get a discrete set of the production lines where it would be priority to have a digital twin, okay? Okay, so finally, how does the final solution work? And this, is, this has been recently implemented already. So we have an online model execution, which is feeding uh, real time uh, with the, both the setup values of the parameters and the setup, the setup values of the parameters are before the process starts, okay? So before the process starts, you know that a particular type of steel roll is coming into the process. And you also know that you have put some uh, configurations or settings into the different uh, equipment, uh, pieces of equipment in the, along the process, okay? So the first thing you wanna answer is, is this configuration of parameters good for the kind of a product I'm trying to make, okay? Or will it lead to an increased defect rate? If that is the case, 
even at the very start of the production line, we can recommend to tweak the parameters uh, specifications for you for the line in order to reduce the probability that the product ends up being defective. Okay. All right. Lastly, and I, I think I'm going to have to jump over this one because I'm out of time and I actually uh, have to wrap it up. But this is something I used to work uh, a longer time ago. And it is about uh, estimating the demand for a road that doesn't, for a toll road that doesn't yet exist. So the gist here is the gist of the problem is that you want to build a discrete choice model uh, and try to assess whether your markets, uh, your different markets, either individual users or cargo uh, are going to use the tollway or not going to use it and how much they're willing to pay for it. So you, use, you solve this problem, use the, call the user equilibrium model to, to conduct a traffic assignment and uh, roughly assess how the traffic would be distributed. And well, the new thing about this is that now, since we have data from devices and that data is cloud store as well, uh, you can create a solution that uh, also follows this cyclical pattern where you're getting new information and then maybe you can set dynamic pricing for your uh, tollways, okay? And this pricing will change at different times of the day and on the different days of the week, for instance, okay? Oh, I love this in Spanish, but it says questions. So, well, it's Q&A time. Uh, so uh, please feel free. I just have about five minutes because I need to jump into another meeting, but uh, Q&A time. Well, I don't want to uh, take much of your time. I just first, uh, I wanted to ask if there is um, like a Bible for data science, uh, like to, as I'm starting this bootcamp, on data science. So if you recommend anyone in English or in Spanish as you wish. And the second thing I'm asking because I have some background on statistics and I would ask about just if you have like a quick answer um, over uh, reliability and which tools can we use? Okay. Like in a general way, please. So first about the bootcamp then I'll talk about the reliability stuff. So about the bootcamp, uh, it's usually a good uh, way to kickstart yourself and to know what is out there in terms of the tools you could use. Okay. Uh, but in reality, I wouldn't, so once you're done with your first bootcamp, so I would, I would say uh, two sources. So docu library documentation, and the okay. cool thing about li library documentation is that if you check uh, the sources for the library documentation, you can uh, also go one step back and check on the ideas that generated uh, those uh, algorithms and models that are now implemented in the libraries. And another one, another very important source that we must not forget about are uh, actual books on the, on, the, on the topic, because sometimes people just rely on posts. Okay. And that's, that's okay if you have a specific question on how to do something. Yeah. Uh, and however, uh, I, I think uh, bodies of knowledge need to make sense. Okay, so you need to always operate in a context where, so so knowing a broader context, knowing the, the, the more course. complete context of what you're doing. So let's let's not forget about that. There are many cool books about deep learning. So you have uh, ones by one by Francois Cholet uh, called Deep Learning with Python, for example. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's one valuable, valuable source. So yeah, once you're done with the bootcamp, be, uh, make, make sure to check out uh, library documentation, uh, library examples, which are very rich, for instance, for SK Learn, which is one of the main libraries we use. And uh, also let's not forget uh, the bit more formal uh, bodies of knowledge, uh, such as literature. Okay. okay, thank you. And about reliability, I'm not a reliability guy, I'm not a quality guy. So okay. <laughs> so really, really don't know what's the deal there. <laughs> okay. Okay. No worries. Thank you so much. Okay. No problem. So, do we have any other question, perhaps? I, I just have one that we were asked um, during the registrations. So, okay. some people were asking um, uh, about the difference because they hear uh, big data, deep learning statistics, uh -huh. um, uh, 
uh, machine learning and uh, i mean is there any difference business intelligence that was also there yeah of course uh, so okay. could you explain a little bit i mean um the differences or how can we use them in business okay cool yeah so i'll give you some boundaries okay so first of all uh let's say ai artificial intelligence is essentially uh extracting patterns and making decisions uh using something you coded <laughs> pretty much okay and inside of that you have you can even think of optimization as ai right because you're making decisions in an artificial way and you can think about uh learning patterns also as ai right okay so cool so we got that down now uh inside of uh statistical learn you can call statistical learning the process where you have an algorithm to uh gain some inference okay so statistical learning is something is, is a term that someone from the statistics community would uh, call it because they care about the inference and I care about the inference. I'm one of those. Uh, if you only care about the prediction or you care mostly just about the prediction, uh, that is more of the from the computer science background. And that is where the machine learning terms come from, term comes from. OK, so essentially you're using. An, so from the point of view of uh, computer science people, you're using a learning algorithm that extracts uh, rules from the data, pretty much. If you want to think about it as a statistician, you're, extract, you're using an algorithm and you, and you can place some inference around the results of that algorithm, okay? So that is what we could call either machine learning or statistical learning, okay? Now, uh, business intelligence, that is already into a more applied context. Uh, that, is, that can include some use of statistical models, but usually it's more about understanding the broader patterns that are happening and it also it, it's also heavily towards the so the building of dashboard type tools okay the dashboard type tools heavier on the visualization emphasis um so i would say that and uh, advanced statistics versus uh machine learning it's it's only about uh where where the algorithm is going to be. But now, as I said during the talk, you can uh, use them to approximate an unknown data generation process. So that, that, that is the way in which they have blended. Okay. Thank you very much, Jose Luis, for the answer and also for the presentation. It was very interesting, also the cases that you have been working with. So I'm sure, um, I mean, we will leave um, your details so that people can contact you perhaps. Uh, okay. Yeah. Other questions and... Uh, also after watching the, the webinars. So thank you once again, just uh, as a closure, as we like to share um, this. So these are our next uh, webinars, okay? So um, of course in the newsletter that where we're gonna send the, the link to the recording uh, for this webinar, we will also send the, the invitation for the next events. Uh, here you can also look at the YouTube channel of uh, ENUPM so uh, we have a playlist there with all the different webinars and so forth and so on. Um, and well, um, other than that, thank you very much. Uh, if, you have, if you have further questions uh, as well about the IMIM and the webinars and all these activities, you can also send us an email here. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Preciado and uh, all our uh, guests here. And thank you for your questions and your participation. And uh, and basically, um, I, 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 I think uh, that's it. Okay. Uh, hey, take care. Bye bye. Need to take off. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye bye, guys. Bye -bye.